So to wrap up our discussion of the composite pattern, there's one more piece of the puzzle, and this is going to be other considerations. And if you read the Gang of Four book, you'll see that they always have a very stylized form for presenting the patterns. And as part of that form, they will say things like, here are some uh, considerations, here's some pros and cons, here's some examples of how this pattern is applied in practice, here's some other things you should think about, um, known uses, and other pattern relationships, and so on and so forth. So at the end of each of these discussions of each pattern, we're going to do some of that kind of stuff. We're going to give some relationships and, and talk about the pros and cons and, and all the good stuff you would find in the Gang of Four book. So let's start by talking about what, what the Gang of Four call the consequences, which is just a fancy way of saying the pros and cons. So one of the things that's good about the composite pattern is it allows everything to be done in a very common way. So components can be treated the same regardless of whether they're leaf nodes, whether they're unary nodes, whether they're binary nodes, what type of binary node they are. We don't have to know, we don't have to care for large swaths of our implementation. And take a look at this example. This example is a wonderful illustration of this. We're going to use the iterator pattern to iterate through every element in an expression tree that we've created using some creational pattern we'll talk about later. And for every node in the tree, we're going to accept a visitor to come perform an operation on that node. And notice how this code does not distinguish between leaf nodes or composite nodes. It just lets you iterate through the tree in whatever old order you designate, and it applies the operation, in this case, the visitor. And we don't even know what that does. It could print, it could evaluate, it could code generate, it could optimize, it could analyze. There's lots of things that that visitor could do. And this piece of code is blissfully unaware of the details of what it does. It holds all the pieces together in a common syntactic expression or representation. And therefore, we don't need type tags, we don't need switch statements, we don't need all these bad code smells. We can abstract things away using the magic of, of pattern relationships, pattern sequences, basically. Another nice thing you can do with this pattern is you can make it transparent to add new capabilities without breaking anything that already exists. So let's say we wanted to add a new type of node. We wanted to add a composite mod node. Well, composite mod node, as you can see here, is inheriting from composite binary node. And that means it can be used anywhere where a composite binary node was expected. So nothing is going to have to change in order to add support for the mod operation. Yet another thing, Classes and interfaces only have to include fields and methods that they actually need or they actually use. There's an there's a insurance company called Liberty Mutual, and their tagline is, uh, only pay for what you need. And I think that's a great tagline here because that's exactly what we're doing here. We're only going to have to implement things that we actually use at a given level of abstraction. So here's our component node. That's the kind of the interface class, the, the abstract base class. And as you can see, it only defines no-op methods and static fields. It doesn't have anything else. It just has the bare bones needed to hold everything together. So here's an example. You can see that the methods it defines, like item, right, and left, those are all basically no-ops, or they throw exceptions if you call them. So they just don't do anything. And then it's up to the subclasses to override those methods and to override them selectively. So here you can see a leaf node overrides the item method and will return the item that's stored by the constructor of the leaf node. If you go back and look at the implementation part of this, you'll see that we had a constructor that stored the value in the item field. And here the item method just returns the m item data member, the value that's stored in that leaf node. Likewise, down here you can see the composite unary node, which inherits from component node, is going to maintain a reference to its right child, and its right method will return the right child. But were you to call the left method on a composite unary node, you'd get a null pointer, which is what it inherits from the component node abstract base class. So those were the those are the pluses. There's very rarely um, perfection with patterns. They don't solve every imaginable problem, and they always come with some liabilities as well. Everything is not uh, unicorns and rainbows, as I like to say. 
So one of the things you get with patterns like composite is perceived complexity. Whereas before, if you did an algorithmic decomposition, you might have a single class called tree node that's what we call a god class that everything relies on. And that's simple at one level because there's just one of them. Whereas if you look on the right-hand side, our pattern and object-oriented decomposition has like a dozen classes. Well, that, and that may seem like more at first, but the deal is once you know the pattern, you don't look at this as a dozen classes. You look at this as a class hierarchy that's refining the component node, and then the subclasses are filling in the blanks as needed in order to get the job done. So it, it's only it's only perceived complexity if you don't understand the pattern. Once you know the pattern, you're like, oh, gosh, that's the composite pattern. I expect to see a bunch of different subclasses. Not a big deal. I've understood it at a higher level. So, of course, what this implies is you've got to know patterns to make sense of this. Another critique of this approach is you can end up with awkward designs, sometimes known as interface bloat. So you'll see here that in some cases we had methods that were defined in component node that weren't really needed for a given subclass. So for example, the item method isn't really used in the composite nodes. It, it, it actually can be used, but it, it doesn't have to be used in that context. And the left and the right children are unused for leaf nodes. They, they exist in the API, but they don't do anything. They're no ops. And that's a fair critique, but honestly, it's not the end of the world. So uh, we just kind of suck it up and deal with it. As with all design choices, the question is not, does this design have no liabilities or no cons? It's how do those cons stack up relative to the alternatives? There's a, a classic um, aphorism that says that you know two hikers are out in the in the forest and they come upon, they come upon a bear and the bear starts to chase them and the one hiker sits down and calmly takes off his hiking boots and puts on his running shoes and his buddy is screaming in terror saying dude what are you doing you know you can't outrun that bear and the other hiker says I don't have to outrun the bear I have to outrun you so that's the that's a bit morbid but the point here is that um, we don't have to have perfection. We have to be better than the alternative approaches. And that's really what patterns allow us to do, to think about those things explicitly. There's also a set of implementation considerations. Do components know who their parents are? Is there an explicit parent pointer or reference from a given child back up to its parent? And the real question there is, do we need to go backwards in the tree? If you need to go backwards in the tree, then you probably need to have um, a back pointer. Uh, another question that we alluded to a moment ago is, do you need to have exactly the same interface for both the leaf nodes and the composites? And the answer is no, but there's a trade-off there between uniformity and parsimony. If you make things uniform, then you won't be parsimonious because you'll have extra methods that aren't always needed. But if you optimize for parsimony, you won't have uniformity. And you kind of have to decide what's more important to you, parsimony or uniformity. By the way, I always thought it was funny that the word parsimony means concise or pithy, but it's a big word, right? So it's like, why didn't they just choose a short word to mean pithy, like pithy? Another consideration here is don't allocate storage for your children in the super class or in the base class. And, and that's, as we'll see later, that's going to be a big problem with the algorithmic decomposition that we alluded to earlier, where every object contains all the state for every different kind of node because you end up paying for things you don't need. You, you violate the Liberty Mutual pledge, only pay for what you need. Another interesting question from a design point of view or an implementation point of view, who deletes the children? Is it the parent's responsibility to delete the children? Is it the child's responsibility to delete its own contents? And this turns out to be an age old conundrum, an age old design dilemma when you deal with recursively defined structures. And in fact, if you take a look at directory commands like rmdir versus rm, you'll see that they make different choices. So the rmdir command, which is a Unix Linux command, POSIX command, it says delete this directory, but only if it's empty. So it won't delete things that are empty. It expects the, the, the child, the directory to know how to delete itself. Conversely, the rm command when past the dash r dash f option will delete the elements even in a non-empty subdirector or subfolder 
So the point is that these are endless decisions or timeless decisions that have to be rethought out for each consideration. There are lots and lots of known uses of composite. So this is very common in windowing frameworks, windowing toolkits. It's very common for ways to represent uh, MIME types, which are inherently recursive. If you think about how you encode MIME types for things like email and so on, obviously directory structures in Unix and Windows, very heavily composite based because they're recursive structures. In the Java world of Java, there's this thing called the, the AWT container, which is a composite. And then there's a technology for distributed object computing known as CORBA. And they have this concept called a naming context. And naming contexts are basically graphs, directed, directed uh, acyclic graphs, where you have con composite nodes called contexts, which are basically like directories. And then you also have leaf nodes, which are basically like files in a directory. And as you can see, contexts can contain other contexts, which can contain contexts and uh, nodes or, or files. So this just are objects. This gives you an idea that this pattern is very, very common. And that's important because something isn't really a pattern if it doesn't occur multiple times. It's just a, maybe a coincidence or what we sometimes call a proto pattern. So to summarize our discussion of the composite tree, this uses uh, the expression tree uh, use of composite. We use this pattern to enhance the uniformity and extensibility of the key internal data structure of the tree. And as you can see here, it is a very nice recursive structure which maps onto the expression tree itself. And the virtue of all this stuff is we can add new nodes and new operations on nodes without breaking what's there. And that's why it's such a valuable pattern.